Welcome everyone to our final webinar in the uh, NASA's Universe of Learning series. Today we're going to be talking about the big question behind NASA's Exoplanet Exploration Research Program, and that question is, are we alone? Um, and of course, that's a big question of humanity for for the ages. And uh, when we uh, ask all of you what you think, if we're alone, I'm going to uh, show you the poll results here. Um, and uh, it looks like most people in this group think there are, are some forms of life, and uh, one has gone out on a limb to say intelligent life. Um, and then in terms of when you think we might find signs of life, uh, nobody says in the next 10 years. Uh, Brandon, I'll be interested in your take on that when we come to the um, content section. And uh, uh, a couple of people actually think it's going to take a lot longer. And in fact, it is a difficult thing, which we'll um, talk about as we go forward. All right. So, um, this is one of the most exciting areas of research, but let me first do the introductions for today's webinar. Um, and uh, as always, um, I'm here from the Smithsonian uh, Astrophysical Observatory along with Erica Wright, and also on the line are Tim and Brandon. Our, um, and also we have Natalie from uh, affiliations headquarters, and uh, we'll be um, Natalie, and we will be uh, really encouraging all of you to uh, submit applications to the mini funds opportunity, which is going to be opening up tomorrow. Uh, and uh, we have an application ready, and I think uh, Erica, have you posted it to the community of practice yet? Not yet. Yeah, not yet. Okay, but we'll post after today's webinar. We'll post a. Um, PDF of it so you can see uh, how simple the application is to fill out, so you should definitely apply for the opportunity. And we'll talk more about that later. Today's content specialist, the subject matter specialist, uh, is um, going to be a very exciting a presentation from Dr. Robert Hurt, who is an astronomer and visualization scientist at um, IPAC, uh, which is one of the NASA Universe of Learning partners. and um, he has done the amazing uh, um, visualizations around uh, many of NASA's exoplanet discoveries. Uh, so today our agenda is, uh, first we're going to talk about some resources related to this idea of exoplanets and finding life in the universe. Uh, and I want to give a specific example of an affiliate in the first round from last year and how uh, the Springfield Museum of Art used NASA's Universe of Learning Resources in an in a, uh, implementation. Then we'll hear from Brandon about NASA's search for life uh, and habitable exoplanets. And um, then we'll hear from Robert on art and science and then finalize by talking about the Lindsay Fund next step. So, um, we've mentioned before the Eyes on Exoplanet computer visualization as uh, an amazing resource around this topic, um, and it's all built on real data. It's a visualization engine built on real data, and I'm going to bring it into the field of view here, and hopefully you guys will tell me it actually does appear in the field of view. Yes. Okay. Um, so let me make it full screen if I can here. And uh, um, and so uh, the um, home screen of the eyes on exoplanet view is this uh, funny screen full of dots of light uh, that are um, shades of orange and yellow. And these are actually all of the discovered host stars for exoplanets or um, solar systems beyond our own. Um, and the, um, the, as I move my um, cursor, uh, hopefully this translates across the zoom, there's a three-dimensional visualization of where all those uh, stars are compared to the sun, and there's many ways to explore them. Um, up here in the highlights corner, 
there's a, uh, some highlights of nearest Earth sized planet, a system with seven Earth sized planets, and I think uh, Robert, we're going to talk more about that later. I'll click on that. Um, NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope recently revealed seven Earth sized planets around a tiny nearby dwarf star. And here's a visualization of this Trappist 1 system. And again, the visualization shows you where they all are, and you can click on a particular planet, and it comes into view again with a visualization of its surface based on data. Robert will talk to us more about that. Um, but it's a great way to explore the discoveries. And this, of course, um, uh, we don't know what color the planets are or what they look like, but but we have data that indicates. Um, issues of whether they're water worlds or whether they're rocky worlds and things like that. And we'll hear all about that today. This is a great visualization resource to explore. Um, and uh, uh, it's uh, downloadable. And um, uh, the slideshow that will be posted on the Community of Practice has the, the URL for that. Um, NASA is also working on a browser-based version of this visualization. So that is Ivan Exoplanet. The next resource I want to um, bring into the field view, uh, it is a page of resources all about that Trappist system. Um, and again, this is from the uh, Spitzer Infrared Space Telescope that uh, contributed to this major discovery of this multi-planet system. Um, and there are lots of images, uh, visualizations, uh, videos, animations, all about um, this discovery, which are really great for uh, programs, activities, exhibits. Um, speaking of uh, exoplanet exploration, the main website, exoplanets.nasa.gov, um, always has updated the number of confirmed exoplanets to date. And you'll see that there's 3,838 as of today. Um, and the, uh, within 2,800 uh, planetary systems, uh, solar systems beyond our own. And then this site also has lots of uh, uh, Interactive, it's where you find the uh, Eyes on Exoplanet downloadable um, uh, application. And there's uh, lots of news, multimedia, uh, infographics, lots of materials to learn about uh, planets beyond our solar system being discovered every day um, by NASA and other uh, ground based telescopes as well. Um, one great way of uh, combining information we get from science with art is um, these uh, exoplanet travel bureau travel posters, visualizations. Again, we're going to talk a lot about how we imagine these other worlds when all we're, all we're often getting from them is a dot of light. But there's a lot of information in that light that comes from these planets. And this uh, uh, Exoplanet Travel Bureau site has great posters um, of different exoplanet discoveries, travel posters, where the grass is always redder on the other side. There's uh, information about this uh, exoplanet and what the, the color of the star, host star's light, uh, where you might not grow green grass, but might have uh, uh, red living things. Um, so that's a great resource. Another um, uh, uh, resource we wanted to highlight is this uh, graphic novel about astrobiology, um, which is a whole interdisciplinary field uh, in itself. And uh, it's really got a lot of great information in it. And I'm highlighting the, these resources because you're going to see how one of your affiliate colleagues put them all together in a program um, in just a little bit. So 
the nice thing I like about this graphic novel is it actually highlights real people working on exoplanets. Um, so uh, uh, it has a lot of um, information about the science and about the people who do the science. Um, let's see, I think that uh, gets me to the end of the resources. So I'm going to um, there's the Trappist illustrations, the Travel Bureau, the graphic novel. So now I'm going to talk about um, to give you inspiration for your implementation applications coming up. Uh, a program that was created last year by Annette Eshelman at the Springfield Museum of Art. And she took the Mini Funds uh, Award and created a program called Artful Exoplanets, Creating Imaginary Worlds. And it was a summer camp program in the particular implementation um, that she did about 15 hours. And you can see there um, a combination of uh, uh, kids interacting with um, computer interactives and online resources, uh, and also using her arts education background, learning, um, uh, creating artwork, and actually creating a public exhibition. Uh, in the Museum of Art. And so you can, the resources you can see uh, include eyes on exoplanets, um, also the Micro Observatory Telescope. She had students learn about astrophotography and uh, imaging uh, other worlds in our own solar system in this case, um, and some, and some uh, star forming regions. Uh, she also used recoloring the universe around um, the uh, idea of image processing and coding. And so she talked a lot about color and visualization. So uh, uh, you can see um, some of the activities uh, being done here by uh, her groups of artful exoplanet participants. Um, and these were her intended outcomes, which I really like the combination. This seemed like a true STEAM program to me, because um, uh, uh, she has some um, outcomes that are around uh, science learning goals and science skills of using computer visualizations. But then she had some uh, visual arts outcomes around gaining mastery of watercolor and paper clay medium use of color and how it helps artists tell a story uh, and uh, understanding the connection between visual arts and other disciplines this is the final exhibition in the upper right of the slide and just to show you the how uh, she um, used the nasa's universe of learning resources but then really brought the strength of her uh, museum arts education these are all the students' uh, watercolors of other worlds. In the back of the gallery are their uh, micro-observatory astrophotography, so images that students created with robotic telescopes and then colorized. And here in the middle of the gallery, she has they had the students create their own graphic novels, like the astrobiology graphic novel, about uh, their um, planet or form of life, and then sculptures of a form of life that might live on that planet with an explanation of, of uh, what the features of that life would be. So it's really kind of an amazing program. So with that inspiration, um, Tim, I'm going to uh, hand the, the wall over to you. I stopped sharing so that you can run the program yourself. Excellent. All right, I think that's up for you folks. So um, before we start today, I just want to make a note. Uh, unlike all of the telescope images that you've seen in the various webinars up to today, we don't actually have a lot of NASA imagery of exoplanets, and that's just due to the size and the distance. They're so they're so small and far away that we don't have much, we, do, we don't know what the surfaces actually look like. So you're going to see a lot of artist impressions today. Um, and we'll have Dr. Hurt talking a little bit later about what, uh, where those uh, artist impressions come from. But people have been thinking about what the first evidence of life on another world might look like uh, through fiction for a long time. You can see a few different examples here, both in uh, movies and books. Um, so 
uh, let me ask you, and I, I want to encourage you to use the, the chat box here on the side. What do you think the evidence for life is going to look like when we first find it? How are we going to know that? And I need to figure out where my chat box disappeared to. Oh, there it is. It's over here. Jumped screens on me. Microscopic evidence for life, respiration, excretion, microbial. Yeah, the, the, the early stuff everybody seems to be saying is probably going to be some pretty small things. The tough things that are tough to see even on Earth. We, we couldn't see microscopic or microbial stuff or, uh, for a really long time through human history. So uh, there's going to be some interesting technology. We'll talk a touch about that today as we go along. Um, so some of the fiction that I do have uh, noted up here uh, is actually inspired by real science. Um, Oh, I like that. Most uh, so so. Kathy here saying most likely to find life that has been ejected from Earth impacts in our own solar system. Um, that big possibility. Yeah, Mary, Mary, so so there's that question from Mary. If we we have a probe on Mars, we could find microbial life there. But what about planets light years away? Well, maybe we'll be able to find microbial life there too. Um, so I'm going to continue, and we'll touch on these other things. So uh, I was saying the fiction is inspired by real science sometimes. Uh, in movie Contact, which I have noted up here, uh, Jodie Foster's character, the protagonist, was inspired by the work of Jill Tarter. Um, so if you're not familiar with Jill Tarter, she is part of the founding staff of SETI, uh, who is – she's the – currently the director of Center for SETI Research, part of the larger SETI Institute. Um, and, well, many members of the public think when we say life, we actually mean intelligent life, but there's a lot more than that. Um, SETI is investigating uh, the possibility of intelligent life, keeping an eye out or an ear out or a, a, a radio out receiver out for it. NASA takes a, a different approach to it. So there's this uh, equation uh, named after another one of the founders of SETI, uh, Frank Drake, the Drake Equation. Uh, and it was developed as a conversation starter to discuss our chances of finding intelligent life. It's not meant to be precise, but it's basically saying that we're going to look out there for first, how many planets are there? How, how many... Uh, yeah, how many stars are there? How fast are stars being made? How many planets are around them? How many of those planets could be possibly habitable? How many of those possibly habitable planets actually have, and so on and so forth. So NASA is working from the left side of this particular equation. First, we're looking for planets. We've got missions. We had missions like Kepler. Now we've got tests out there, and we're still analyzing all this other data that has come in. Uh, and we've got a pretty good handle on about how many planets there are up there compared to the number of stars. Turns out it's about uh, one planet per star. Um, and there's a little more work to be done, um, and that's why we have TESS up there to kind of jumpstart this next phase. Uh, it's looking for those planets which are close enough to Earth for us to, uh, for us to actually study and see could life exist there, or are there actually potential signs of life? That second one's going to be a lot tougher. Um, the missions we have up there right now, the uh, Hubble and Spitzer space telescopes, for example, can eliminate some places. We can say life does not exist there. Uh, future missions are going to be able to do that even better and maybe start finding some of those potential signs of life. Um, and once we've got that, we will be able to continue looking for life itself. Uh, right now, there's a decadal study. Uh, every 10 years, there's a decadal study that NASA puts on, and we're currently working on figuring out what the, the concept studies for the next big telescope to go up in the 2030s. And there are four different proposals out there. And three of those four actually have major exoplanet uh, aspects to them. In fact, one I think is like just exoplanets. Uh, it's a huge 
uh, piece of the science that scientists are our astronomers are looking at right now today. It's it's a hot topic, uh, and there's such exciting stuff going on. So we have it's it's a fairly new topic as well. Conceptions have changed uh, as we get new evidence through new tools. It was only in '92 or '93 that we found that for. Found the first exoplanet orbiting around a pulsar. Um, 25 years ago, we hadn't even found a single exoplanet around a main sequence star like our sun. Now, uh, as we were just discussing, there are over 3,800 confirmed exoplanets, uh, and we've got what was at 2,800 some odd, 2,900 almost candidates that we need to look at a little bit closer. And we're going to be finding more and more as Tess looks up there and. There are plenty of exoplanets up there which we can't even observe at all based on how those detection methods, which we talked about last time, line up. It depends on the orientation of the planets and how they orbit the star compared to where we are. Um, some methods might be able to find those, but there's lots of data we're not going to, there, there's lots of stuff out there that just based on the orientation we may not be able to find out. So we're looking up those planets and we're starting to figure out are they possibly habitable? Are they in the habitable zone? Now, habitable does not mean that they have life on them. That's a, that's a misconception that a lot of people have. There is no one definition of what the habitable zone is, uh, but the concept is really, the basic concept is really graspable by the public. Uh, it has to do with temperature. Is this uh, planet in a zone where there could be liquid water on the on that planet, or is it too close to the star and too hot, or is it too far away? And if there is water, it's going to be a frozen wasteland. What's the size of that planet? If that planet is as big as Jupiter, well, it's going to be a gas giant. There's not going to be any solid surface for anything to be on. Um, so the size needs to be appropriate. Uh, what sort of atmosphere is there? Is it does it have this huge hydrogen helium exosphere that basically blankets in all of the heat and keeps it from uh, having the necessary conditions for life. And there's more than just heat to that. Or maybe it has no atmosphere at all, which is going to make it very difficult for anything to live there. Um, we can tell a little bit of that right now. And, and that's one of those important things that go into figuring out if something's in a habitable zone. If you want to know a little bit more about this, um, Last week, we mentioned the Universe Unplugged videos and the Habitable Zone video. Well, they have the Universe Unplugged unplugged. Uh, you can look at how the Habitable Zone video was made, and you can hear from some of the scientists and some of the developers, like Dr. Hurt, who you're going to hear from a little bit later today, about how they made this, what decisions went into it. Uh, and I've got two links here in the uh, uh, presentation that you can access a little bit later to go check it out. and. Uh, watch these because there's some really fascinating stuff in there. So after after knowing whether something is in a habitable zone or not, we might start thinking a little more closely what actually indicates that life is there. Not necessarily detecting the life itself, but are there traces of something that could clue us in as to what's going on? So the, the big obvious one that many people think about is water. I mean, all life as we currently know it requires water. So on the top right there, we've got a we've got a uh, image there, uh, uh, interpretation I think, uh, of Enceladus, where we have found water. Uh, another possible idea is looking for CFCs or other complicated uh, molecules. Uh, I think David noted in the chat there, look for air pollution to suggest industrial activity. Those are the CFCs are the sorts of things that aren't created by natural processes. They need some sort of industrial activity to be up there. So if we found those, we'd have a pretty good clue that life was there. Um, unfortunately, that those would probably exist in such trace amounts that we wouldn't be able to detect. But if we did, it'd be amazing. Uh, another possible option is looking for things like oxygen and methane in the atmospheres of planets. Um, we found places with oxygen. We found places with methane. We haven't found anything with both of them. Uh, methane, we know that both methane can exist by itself and oxygen can exist by itself. But if you put the two in an atmosphere by themselves, one of them is going to be eliminated unless 
there is life there. As far as we know, we haven't come up with a mechanism that could have both of them simultaneously with our life. So that's a particular combination of uh, different chemicals that would indicate life could be there. There may be others too. Um, and that's, that's a big work of some research going on. So how, so we've talked a little bit about how we can see life. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about how we can see without visiting. And thank you, Mary. Uh, she's put up the poll asking you, first off, what's the simplest form of extraterrestrial life that you would find exciting? Chemical signs of life, bacteria or lower plants, slimy or furry things, or you are not gonna be excited until there is intelligent life out there. The answers are coming in. Yes, yes, the answers are coming in slowly. Um, go ahead and put yours in. We get a wide range from the public. I can see we're getting a, getting, getting a few answers here. I'm, I'm always amused at how different this is from session to session. I'll, I'll yeah, show. you want to review, show that one? So uh, about half of you are going to be excited with chemical signs of life. A uh, few of you need the bacteria or lower plants. Uh, one of you, we need intelligent life or uh, it's just not quite worth it. I think last time we did this, we had a majority of people, they wanted the slimy or the furry things. Um, all of these are gonna be amazing uh, when they eventually get found. I'm an optimist. Uh, will that be in my lifetime? I don't know, we'll see. Um, I do think, I do think that there's a huge chance of getting some of those chemical indicators of life in, in our lifetimes. Uh, Brandon could probably speak to that a little bit better than I can. Um, uh, but going into what those chemical signs of life could be, how we can see that life without visiting. We've talked about spectroscopy before, um, looking at the atmosphere, well, looking at, uh, the makeup of, uh, gases or other things out there, the, as the light comes in uh, from an outside source, if we break it up through a prism or some sort of diffraction grating or something else, if we break up that uh, light into its component colors, both visible and the invisible ones, we can measure how much of each of those different types of light are. And we can get this, uh, we can translate those dark spots and bright spots on that rainbow into a graph. Uh, and then when we look at that, we can actually analyze how much of this is there, how much of this is there. Is there a particular fingerprint which says, oh, here's some oxygen, here's some carbon dioxide. Um, and what we've got going on on the left in this image is you can actually see a star and you can see the light from that star going in every direction. Some of that starlight is blocked by this planet that's in between the star and our telescope up in space. And some of that light is actually passing, just kind of grazing by the edge of that planet. And it's getting stopped by, some of it's getting stopped, some of it's passing through this atmosphere. And what gets stopped and what goes through depends on what that atmosphere is made of. And I'm gonna show you some, some videos and other things that, that help this a little bit better as well. Um, but this is, once that light comes through, we can analyze it both with and without the planet and see how those are different, what is actually there. Um, right here, we've got uh, two different patterns. Uh, these are the rainbows, these aren't turned into the graphs. The one on the top uh, is an Earth-like world. You can see in there, there's ozone, oxygen, water, methane, carbon dioxide, and there are a couple different spots where something like uh, water or methane show up. Um, these tend to have signals in a couple different spots. Some of them are easier to see than others. Sometimes it's you're more certain when you're able to see multiple ones. On the bottom, we have another uh, spectra, and this one is a methane-filled world. Uh, all of those all of those gaps in there are indicating that uh, the methane in that planet's atmosphere is a uh, is absorbing some of the starlight, and it's not getting through to us. Um, and based on where those gaps are and the pattern of them, we can tell what's going on. Um, so here's another question for you to think about. And if you've got some ideas and want to put them in the chat right away, that'd be great. Um, but how do you think you could do an activity around this? Uh, is there a way you can make this uh, into something that the 
your audience can grasp fairly quickly. Uh, and I'm sure there's some much better ways than, than having me sit there and talk to them. What can they do hands-on to actually figure this out? And I've got some ideas too, but I want to give you guys a chance to see if you can write anything down first. So it looks like you guys are thinking a little bit. So uh, what, one of the things uh, that might be possible, and maybe you've got a set of papers with a bunch of, yeah, so there's, there's one from Carol, giving them an absorption spectrum and having them analyze. Yeah, look at, look at this graph of lines or, this, this, or maybe the rainbow with the things and see where these different gaps are. What can you break it down? Um, one thing we've tried, is to give them a set of papers with a bunch of different possible answers. So we give them one that says, this one is methane, this one is hydrogen, this one is oxygen. And then we give them a mystery one and say, well, if you compare these, how do you figure out what's there? Uh, Kevin's suggesting diffraction filters with different types of light. Yeah, there are, um, you can get some uh, lights that are filled with particular gases. And if you were to turn those on um, and hold up diffraction filter, you can actually see a different set of lines in there. Um, mystery blue shifted or red shifted to make it interesting. Yeah, that would, that, oh, that would be fun if, uh, if you add some variations in the data like Carol is suggesting, uh, because what we get back from space isn't always nice and neat, despite how we uh, often try to present it when we're teaching. Good, 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 good. So this is, this is a very complicated uh, piece to communicate with the public, particularly if you're trying to do it and uh, make it something quick. So uh, we're always, always looking for ideas. Um, I can, a lot of the future science that we're gonna be seeing on exoplanets is going to be all about spectroscopy. So we have to find ways to communicate that. Um, so I'm going to show you this. I mentioned a little video, um, and I'm going to play this really quick. Uh, this is only about 11 seconds or so. But this kind of visualizes a little bit better than those basic pictures. You can see the light from the star going through. One type of light is getting stopped by the atmosphere of that planet. The other type of light is just passing right through that, that uh, planet. Uh, and on to be detected by whatever might be there. So uh, video things might help with uh, communicating that as well. If you check out the link at the top, the SVS, the Science Visualization Studio link, I'm pointing off to where my screen is. Um, if you uh, look at that, you will be able to see the full video and get the context for this. Uh, it goes into what's going on with this uh, transiting exoplanets and how we detect what's there in a lot more detail. Uh, there's also another resource at the webtelescope.org site where you can see uh, something related to this as well. So how else can we learn about life? Well, direct imaging may help us as well. Uh, we had uh, Dr. Vanessa Bailey the other week who talked a little bit about uh, some of this. And right here, just giving you a sense of it, we've got this uh, picture with some uh, lines on it. Uh, most of what you're seeing in this picture actually are uh, artifacts from the way the, the camera captured light. But this is actually a picture that Voyager 1 took. Uh, last picture it took staring back towards the Earth and this picture is known as the pale blue dot. And if you look very carefully in here, you might be able to see the Earth. And if you can't quite see it, I'll give you a little help. There it is. Tiny little dot. Um, our planet is very small in the grand scheme of things. And that's a picture still from within our own solar system we are getting better and better technology. It's growing by leaps and bounds. And uh, we may be able to find some more information about uh, from the light that comes directly from exoplanets and see how it changes um, over time as it goes around a star. And if we could eventually get that technology that might resolve a planet into multiple pixels, Oh, that would be that'd be fantastic. The, the sorts of things we could tell. Is it different in one place? Are there seasons going on as it goes through? Um, so 
it's a really, really fabulous field. And it's really exciting for us and for the public as well. Um, one question we do get asked sometimes is, uh, well, why are you just looking for life as we know it? Aren't there all these other possibilities about what life could be? And the answer is yes. Um, but right now we can only kind of look for life as we know it. There could be other life out there, but we don't know how to look for that or separate it out from the other noise. So at least for the moment, given our current technology, that's the type of life we're looking for. Um, so I'm going to leave you at that. And uh, I see that Dr. Robert Hurt has joined us. So I am going to uh, stop sharing my screen and pass it over to Dr. Hurt. Thank you. Let's see. Uh, okay, so here's my share. And uh, share desktop. And start my presentation. So. Uh, uh, Always a, a great pleasure to be here to uh, be able to talk a bit about uh, how we do the visualization side of science communication for uh, the missions that we work with. Um, I'm uh, Robert Hurt, as, uh, as you know now, and uh, the title that I've adopted these days, I, I thank uh, Frank Summers for uh, coining and sharing with the community that of astrophysicist, uh, someone who's uh, basically trying to find a way to help uh, communicate science through the visual side of the spectrum. Uh, and I'm here to talk about how we use art to help data speak for itself, or at least better speak for itself. Now, there are times when you have a piece of science that's embodied in a data plot that to the, you know, the, the untrained eye won't really have a lot of meaning. But in some simple cases, like this, uh, this plot of a, uh, a spectral energy distribution, just taking the raw data and enhancing it with a little bit of uh, artwork can actually add the, uh, the semantic meaning so that I think it becomes accessible to people. So for instance, if you take this plot and simply overlay it with a diagram indicating that part of this is pulling light from the hot emissions of a white dwarf star, and another segment of the data is referencing the glow from a warmer uh, disk surrounding the white dwarf, you can really actually take the data and almost make it directly accessible with a little bit of art to enhance it. However, uh, another example, for instance, uh, is if you were looking at, in this case, this is the time sequence of the brightness of an unresolved uh, young star in the system, uh, as seen in the infrared. And there is a point at which the overall brightness of the system changes rather erratically. And now, you know, the data itself doesn't make it clear what's going on. So you can have some interpretation that you're looking at a collision event between large bodies and the star system produced, uh, that produced increased dust emission. But that, again, isn't really engaging. But again, with the right piece of artwork in there, you can actually really give people the visual context. So you can take a glance and go, oh, something happened there. And then hopefully you've enabled sort of the secondary process of, oh, because now there's all this stuff that got kicked out in the system. That's why the system looks brighter. And then you can use this as an opportunity to dig in and explain a little more about infrared light and what's going on here. Of course, with exoplanets, what we see is, is incredibly disconnected from these stories that we're trying to tell people, right? We're looking at the light generally of an unresolved star. We have very few examples where we've been able to pick something out from light, though as we move forward, maybe we'll get a few more direct detection measurements, and those will be exciting and will largely stand on their own. But, but in general, we're just looking at the light from a blob, and uh, from that we are deducing things like the, uh, the stellar type of the star, maybe the orbital period of the planet, the distance from the star, the size, and maybe in more rare instances, actually knowing something about the planet's mass and density and then potentially the atmospheric makeup. But of course, none of these measurements can be seen in the, uh, the data picture. So we go to art to help fill in those visual signs. Now, in this case, you know, we're really just playing around with the idea of take, take what we know and make a creative illustration that embodies some of this information. You know, in, in a way, I feel like I'm now, as my, in my professional career, I'm doing art the way I did as a little kid, which is you draw a picture and then you would take it to your folks and say, okay, this part, that's the sun, and here's where the atmosphere, here's where this, the, 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 uh, this is our house, and this is our dog, right? Science motivated art is kind of the same thing. You do an illustration and you try to add in as many bullet points and elements as you can point to 
can say here, this particular diagram of an uh, exoplanet is establishing a number of things like its relative size compared to the Earth. Uh, we can visually establish that it has a gaseous or cloudy atmosphere, and with a little hint of uh, radiative glow, establish that the planet is hot. Or in the case of a uh, world that's found in the habitable zone, um, uh, one year my colleague Tim Pyle over to my right did, uh, you know, there's you see the art, but there's actually a lot of things that were added to this to help tell the science story. Uh, one of the primary elements uh, constraints was we didn't want to put any greenery on the surface because there was, of course, absolutely no evidence of life existing. And you don't want to put something there that's overselling the science of what's actually in the result, right? You want to talk about the possibilities, but not really get people too spun up over the existence of life when we, uh, we haven't had that story to tell yet. But adding oceans on the surface helps imply its location in the habitable zone, where if you have the right makeup, you are at the right distance to support liquid water on the surface. Uh, in this particular world, it was on the outer edge of the uh, habitable zone of that star, so uh, Tim added larger ice caps to suggest a much colder world than Earth. Uh, we actually were able to represent the color of the star correctly, that it has effectively the color of an incandescent light bulb, uh, not really the deep red that you often see in the artwork, which doesn't really correctly represent the uh, even the red dwarf stars. And uh, you can even throw in the representation of the four inner planets in the system, including a teeny little one that's transiting the star. Of course, the uh, favorite exoplanet system for me, and I, I, I would hope for everybody right now, is the TRAPPIST-1 system, just for the remarkable uh, uh, idea that we found a system that has seven Earth-sized worlds known to date. And to the trained eye, even the data itself for TRAPPIST-1 is quite remarkable. Uh, if you know what to look for in uh, transit diagrams, just to see a, a forest of little dips in the light from the star, uh, each representing the transit of one of these seven worlds. And the, the, uh, the clarity of that, the, uh, in this, this is uh, the Spitzer light curve of the uh, Trappist-1 system from uh, 500 hours of observations. And, and you know, when you're used to looking at light curves, it, it's very seldom that you see such really clearly defined uh, dips, which really speaks to the uh, overall size of these planets relative to the size of the star that they're passing in front of. But this kind of plot isn't what gets you on the cover of Nature or above the fold on the New York Times. This is why we come back to the art. We want to come up with illustrations that really capture people's excitement and stands up against everything that people are uh, expecting out of movies and TV shows these days, right? So we want the artwork to represent that story as well as we can. Now, uh, Sometimes uh, when it comes to doing art, you, you fall back to the same techniques that anyone might. Uh, uh, in the case of TRAPPIST-1, I wanted to play around with an idea of uh, showing the planet sort of abstractly on a tabletop. And in order to just uh, lay that scene out, I uh, pulled out some marbles and tossed them on my carpet in the living room and played around until I got a layout that I felt looked kind of cool. And that became the seed of the idea that then I built in CG, where we were able to represent the you know, relative sizes of the planets correctly. We did a kind of a square root scaling of the relative orbits. And we were even able to use um, the presence of water splashed on the tabletop as a metaphor for the habitable zone by showing that uh, the water too close to the star evaporates into steam, too far away from the star uh, frosts over into ice. And, and th there's a kind of rough fuzzy band in the middle where water could be in a liquid form. Of course, the, uh, the other view of sort of what happens, uh, how the sausage is made, you know, when uh, in the case of the Trappist-1 planet, this is just a little view into the procedural textures we use to build out something that has, you know, the right level of detail and uh, visual interest. And in highlights, in fact, this particular one was the uh, uh, Trappist-1 D, which was at that point thought to be potentially interesting, if it were tidally locked to the planet, there might be a band of habitability that, uh, from the early discovery, the uh, analogies to the Jovian system were very strong, and the idea that we know that the Jovian moons are tidally locked to Jupiter, uh, they, we wanted to establish this idea that a tidally locked planet would have this very asymmetric appearance, that the star fights star facing side would look very different than the side facing away. And in some cases, you might have these little uh, bands of habitability in between the too hot and the too cold, the sort of a fully light zone on the planet. But 
science is always changing, and in merely the course of a year, even our sense of what the TRAPPIST-1 system was like changed rather significantly, uh, where the initial focus was how close these planets were to the star and how they might be tidally locked, to a uh, later view that, in fact, their gravitational influences on each other was so strong that, uh, that, that maybe that might override tidal locking to the star, and it might wipe out the sense of uh, this asymmetrically designed planet. So uh, a year later, we got to redesign all of these planets, uh, suiting sort of the more recent results and uh, the idea that now uh, TRAPPIST-1e might be the most Earth-like of the planets, uh, having established that it has a density very close to the Earth and is uh, in a relatively almost the same location in the habitable zone. And to date, uh, that has been uh, uh, reaffirmed by a number of research projects, though, you know, uh, the changing artwork as we tell a new story will, I think, help document the history of how our understanding of these planets change over time. Uh, fortunately, the uh, illustration that Tim did from the surface of one of these icy worlds is still technically within the realm of possibility, so we, we didn't have to redo this one with the, uh, as new data came in. Uh, if you'd like to follow up and experience a little bit of this, because we had already adapted these, uh, and developed these assets for showing the surface of these planets, uh, just this past year in conjunction with Spitzer's 15th anniversary, we released Exoplanet Excursions, a uh, VR experience that takes you to, uh, the, takes you on a journey through the Trappist system and talks a little bit about our um, hypotheses of what these worlds could be like. And it can be experienced both on, uh, you know, Oculus and Vive headsets, but uh, even as a YouTube 360 movie that you can, you know, put the dragon on your desktop or experience by holding your phone up. And uh, we, it's our hope that if um, we get new results, we may be able to update this and sort of tell the evolving story as time goes on. Uh, also note, there are a lot of assets specifically out there on the TRAPPIST-1 system, including the really spectacular uh, exoplanetary travel poster from JPL, uh, and a whole plethora of um, uh, artwork that's really designing and, and presenting the, the, the cool cross-section of possibilities that these worlds uh, exhibit from the data so far. But, but I think when it comes to just engagement in science art, I think this is, it's, it's really important to emphasize this is something that anyone can play, a game that anyone can play, because from kids to adults, just if you encourage people to go and study up and learn as much as they can about an exoplanet or a world or honestly any piece of science, and then go draw it, right? This is what the A in STEAM is all about. Uh, there is no right or wrong answer at this point, so there's a lot of room for creativity. But if people sit down to create a piece of art, that's informed by the story they want to tell, and that story is based in science. I think this is an incredible uh, opportunity for everybody at all skill levels to really have the fun that, that you know, I get to do on a day-to-day -day basis as well. But uh, as uh, uh, Tim has already referenced, I thought I would throw in a slide myself that we have had another great opportunity under Universal Learning to make uh, a little more fun uh, video out of Exoplanet Science, which is the Habitable Zone series. And um, we had the, just a fantastic opportunity to work with some great celebrities, Kara uh, uh, Gee and Cass Anvar from uh, The Expanse, which is actually one of the most uh, scientifically accurate uh, uh, projections of what the uh, colonization of the solar system might uh, look like, you know, a few hundred few hundred years hence, uh, and uh, Perry Shin from uh, General Hospital uh, playing a uh, computer AI that has a bit of a Rod Serling complex. So we have one episode out right now, uh, the uh, Habitat episode uh, called Goldilocks Paradox is available on YouTube and on our website, universeunplugged.org, and early next year we'll have the second episode out, which will be called The Scorched Earth Enigma. And in this series, what we're trying to do is look at, in each episode, one different aspect of what it takes to make a planet habitable. In this case, the story is about the temperature and composition. And uh, next year, the story will be about uh, the, uh, the overall hospitality, hospitality, hospitability. Oh, boy, I can't even say that word today. Hospitality of the star. How about that? <laughs> So, uh, yeah, we, we hope you enjoy these and uh, enjoy the uh, after show discussions where we then get a chance to really uh, dig in a little more into the science here. So, uh, anyway, that wraps up my presentation today. Let me stop my sharing here. 
All right. Thank you very much. Um, and let me open it up for some questions here. If you have any, as always, feel free to unmute yourself and speak them in, or you can type them into the chat box. Robert, be before you <laughs> joined, we did show a program model of, of one of the uh, prior uh, museum educators from a museum of art who did just what you said, who had her students um, create visualizations of other worlds that they imagined. And they looked at eyes on exoplanets and your visualizations and some of the travel bureau posters and then and then created, they learned some art techniques of watercolor and how to represent worlds and then they visualized themselves. That's absolutely fantastic. And, you know, the, the very fact that there are planets that I have illustrated at this point, um, what is it, I think 55 Cancri E, I have done at this point five different visualizations of it that, that change every time. That it's so important that the idea that there is no right answer yet, right? Until we actually go and get a picture of the surface. There's a lot of room for figuring out how to take your creative expression and, and connect it to something that is it's, it's motivated, but, but is a, a, establishing a kind of um, uh, almost like a visual hypothesis, uh, as a term a, a friend uh, suggested a while ago for another piece of uh, artwork I had done where it was a view of the Milky Way galaxy, but there were features in that that we didn't have data for at the time that we filled out, and later they were confirmed. So anytime you draw a picture of a, an exoplanet and you put a feature there, right, that is like a hypothesis that you're putting it. You're, you're recording it in, through art rather than through words, but it's something that we, we look for, and that as time goes on, as we learn more about these worlds, we can then confirm or deny, is there water here? Are there oceans? Are, are there clouds or gas or things that might uh, be compatible with life? Uh, there's a question from Kevin here. Uh, what is the process to transform visualizations into high resolution graphics for large venues such as big screen or planetarium domes? So uh, a lot of what we do, we release, well, we certainly release video now at HD. We're actually starting to pivot towards um, trying to support 4K video in the future, though that definitely has a lot of overhead to the production times. Uh, we do release assets, for instance, the Trappist-1 planets. Uh, we actually, on that uh, uh, Trappist-1 uh, uh, page I linked on the Spitzer site earlier, we actually released surface map assets for all of the artwork we developed for the Trappist-1 planets. So you can pull that in to your own you know, 3D dome systems. I think it's already been uh, incorporated into um, uh, Univu and uh, some of the other um, uh, uh, planetarium uh, commercial software systems that's sort of built-in modules. Um, there are other projects we're involved with. For instance, uh, I know that um, uh, LSST is helping to develop some uh, assets that are going to go out to the planetarium community soon. We're actually doing some of those assets as well. And uh, some of the things that we develop for press releases, we then take in and we are, are you know, reimagining these in uh, sort of a 4K full dome scenarios that uh, can be used as clip art for that. So uh, beyond that, it's, it's kind of tough because you know any. 3D graphic process you do it usually ends up really deeply tied to the specific software. So I personally developed in Lightwave, and so I that that crazy shader tree I showed you earlier that works awesomely in an older version of Lightwave <laughs> actually doesn't even work in the current one, uh, but it doesn't work in any other software. So you know we can we share sort of the rendered out maps, but the assets become very very specific to a particular version of a piece of software. Uh, another question here from Kathy. Uh, are scientists interested in exoplanets for other purposes other than finding signs of life? For example, are there other important questions that can be answered by studying exoplanets? Well, yeah, it's, I think that's uh, uh, the media gets focused on life. And that's one of the things that, that certainly, you know, when we do something that looks very friendly uh, as a piece of art, you, we, it definitely gets amplified a lot. But the, the science itself is so interested in every aspect of this. And Tim, I, I, you, you can speak to this, any of any of one on the call, I think, can speak to this, that just the process of studying the incredible variety of systems that are out there just do so much for expanding our understanding of how planets form in the first place. I mean, you know, the, the first exoplanetary system discovered around a normal star was uh, 51 Pegasi, and that was 
an entire modality that no one had even imagined could exist at that point. Uh, the idea that you would take something as big as Jupiter and throw it in an orbit that only takes a few days to go around the planet wasn't in any textbook. It wasn't even wildly hypothesized. And that alone has created so much good science in trying to understand like how how planets form and how there may be different processes, in some cases leaving Jupiters out where they are in our system, but in other cases dragging them in closer to the star. And that it enhances the entire process of understanding where our planet came from and why systems may have more or fewer Earth-sized worlds, right? It's all part of the, the bigger story. Another area where astrophysics is being um, pushed forward by exoplanet studies is just understanding stars. The Kepler mission had us, you know, understanding so much about uh, astro seismology and the, you know really taking a look at how stars vary uh, um, you have to really understand that to figure out if you're de really detecting a planet around a star so there's um, just the technology for studying exoplanets is yielding to discoveries in lots of other areas as well there's kind of a related question here uh, what do exoplanets tell us about stellar evolution the, uh, I'm not as much of an expert on that, so, but uh, aside from what <laughs> Mary was just saying, right, it's, uh, uh, though, I, in fact, let me pop back the other weird planet type I wanted to mention from the earlier question also is this, uh, another class of object that we've never seen in our own solar system is this idea of a super Earth, something that is maybe twice as big as the Earth, something that falls sort of in between Earth and Neptune, and this is incredibly exciting, too, because there's a lot of, um, a lot of fertile research be done to understand what could a super earth be like you know could a super earth actually be habitable if you had something that's one and a half times as big as the earth or twice as big uh there's so much we don't understand yet about how that would affect the atmospheric chemistry i mean we can make basic calculations like what the surface gravity would be like and people have even done the numbers and actually found that if if you did say evolve on a super earth how much harder it would be to have a space program, just because the amount of energy it would take to blast off from the surface would be vastly larger than it is on our planet. And that, you know, you might end up with a races that were like forever locked on their world because gravity would, would prevent them from, uh, from exploring even their uh, local objects. Yeah, I'd like to um, go back to David's um, question about stellar evolution. Uh, which I think is a really fascinating question because the first exoplanet that was ever discovered was around a pulsar, which is just kind of, you know, it's kind of blows your mind. How does that get there, right? What, what must, have, if you could be on that planet, what must have you seen to, uh, in, in the life of that star? But, or even the possibility, uh, we, we had done a press release for Spitzer some time ago on the idea that planets could form around a pulsar from the material yes. of the Supernova, that you could literally have a phoenix planet reborn out of a, like a planet that wasn't there before the star blew up. And uh, again, there's a lot that isn't understood about that. But yeah, it just yeah. It completely changes the, the sense of, of what, the, the point which you think the star is dead, that might just be the next stage of telling a new planetary. And we, we are finding planets um, that don't have stars. So these sort of rogue planets that are going through, you know, there's a whole lot of interesting um, science to be done, particularly with the future W first mission about with and micro lensing about finding these planets and how do you get these planets to form and be ejected from their um, birthplace from their parent systems. Um, but I think to answer your question, David, that is an active area of research. For example, astronomers are very interested in understanding um, how planets around, for example, M dwarfs, these small stars, how are they stable and can they form and exist during the, the course of an M dwarf's life, which is longer at this point than the age of the universe? The M dwarfs can live, you know, to tens, hundreds of billions of years. And they're the most numerous type of star in the universe. And so if you look, think about the idea of the search for life, for example, if, if, if they can be formed around these types of stars, and if that's common and they can be stable, then that bodes really well for the possibility of finding life in the universe. Um, however, there's a lot of indication that as those stars evolve, those particular types of stars, they tend to be more active and they might um, be less hospitable to, to 
exoplanet. So this is an area of active research, understanding the different types of stars um, and what they do as they age and what does that mean for any planets that might be in those systems. And that'll be the topic of the second episode of the Habitable Zone. <laughs> yes. There you go. <laughs> All right. Well, we are about out of time. So thank you again uh, for joining us, Dr. Hurt. Uh, and we need to, yes, Mary is pulling up the application that will be going live tomorrow. Would you like to talk about that, Mary? Yes. Uh, actually, let me, sorry, I shared the wrong screen, but I'm glad I, I was going to bring the application into the screen, but I it isn't. I see that it is there. <laughs> so I'm going to look over here at the screen that it's in. Um, the, uh, uh, yes, so opening tomorrow is um, uh, the application for mini funds. Next week, uh, we'll have a, um, a Q and A session for those of you who want to apply. And so I just wanted to give you a little preview of. Um, uh, so the application indicates, you know, the required elements. We want you to describe a project that uses some of the resources we've talked about over the webinar series uh, that has a possibility to share your program model with other institutions. Um, and in fact, I think we'll post the program model I shared today on the community of practice. You can see an example of a documentation of a program model. Um, and uh, uh, essentially, it's a quick application to fill out, uh, 300 words of cure. We, you don't have to write a whole 15 pages or anything. So uh, uh, um, uh, uh, information about your goals, the timing, um, we like these implementation to be done uh, kind of between the beginning of 2019 and September 30th. If it goes beyond that, uh, that's fine. We'll, we'll want some documentation before, um, before October. There's lots of different format types you might uh, suggest, think about proposing to uh, do with different audiences. Um, and uh, 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 so we really encourage you to use your imagination on how you might engage audiences in this content. Um, and uh, let's see, let me bring this back into the our slide. I have no idea how I'm doing this. Let's see, there we go. Ah, okay. Um, let me add on to that, that we are very interested in helping you out. Uh, if you've got some ideas and you're not sure how to write it out, talk to us. Uh, if you need help with actually getting hold of subject matter experts or something else in order to make a program help it happen, let us help you. Right. So the um, uh, next week on December 5th, we'll have a Q&A session. So we'll be here kind of uh, basically to answer your questions as you think about your implementation plan. We'll offer ideas, um, be able to give you feedback on uh, ideas you have. And um, another aspect of helping is the application asks if you are interested in um, either engaging a subject matter specialist, so like a virtual Q&A like we've just had with Robert, and we can help arrange that as well. One of the key things, uh, key assets that uh, NASA's University of Learning has is access to the scientists who are doing research on all these topics. And um, while they may not always be able to visit uh, personally your um, institution, uh, we have lots of uh, scientists and other subject matter specialists who are, are very keen on doing virtual presentations. Uh, so with that. I'm what time would the Q&A be? Would it be at 2 o'clock like uh, t this week? Two, yes, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Uh, Pacific. Thank you. Yes. And we'll send out an announcement about that as well. Yeah. So the applications will be opening tomorrow. We'll be uh, making sure you have the link for that. Please join us for the Q&A next week. Uh, 
And we are looking to get those applications in by January 4th, and we should be letting people know uh, later in January. Any Great. last thoughts, Mary? No, I uh, look forward to continuing the conversation with all of you as you develop your um, uh, implementation ideas. We uh, certainly learned a lot from the last cohort of affiliates who did this, so we're looking forward to your ideas again. We do love working with all of you, and uh, we, we look forward to continuing. So thank you, everybody, for attending uh, this and all the webinars. Thank right. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.